Hi, Leonard. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm fantastic. So, do we address you as Doctor? Does Ryan? I'm I'm good with Ryan. That's, that's fine okay, with me. Good. All right. This is Abra Schiff. Hey, Abra. We'll be doing half the interview. Okay. I thought. I wrote down some questions. She wrote down some questions. But we'd love to start off with with you telling us your latest uh, your latest insights, your latest prognostications. <laughs> All right, that's a it's a good lead in. Um, well, I think uh, I think Paul just kind of pitched talking about uh, about media, right? Which the more I talk about, the more I realize this is, it's a, it's a many headed beast and, and, and everything is, everything is a very, very rich and vibrant topic unto itself. So we've got, uh, historically, I've talked a lot about gaming. Um, we also, I mean, we all have Does a smart gaming come our, under, excuse me, I'm going to yeah. interrupt a lot. Go for it. Does gaming come under the headline of media? I, I tend to think so. Um, we have our first disagreement, and that always makes for an interesting interview. I guess, I guess, I guess it depends on how we're defining media. I'm thinking of media in the, in in, the, in light of technology, perhaps, or different avenues of technology. Um, we can also, find, I think, that media itself is another one of the another one of the multiple heads. We've got social media, and we've got uh, just the technological capability to connect to so many different news sources and to connect to each other in all sorts of new ways. You know, we've got, uh, we've got Netflix and chill. We've got phones in our pockets that connect us to, uh, to, to an electronic space with sort of uh, not limitless, certainly, but, but growing possibilities and opportunities and, and virtual realities. So it's, uh, it's it, almost it's a like bit... a metaverse. Yes, absolutely. So many different ways to utilize your time through technology. Um, so many different ways to either connect to others or disconnect from others. So, um, you know, to me, when we talk about media or maybe maybe technology being the the, the broader term, I think what what's just, yeah, I mean that's that's really what strikes me is that we have we we have new ways of relating to each other. Uh, we have new ways of of, of being in relationship with other or not others or not being in relationship with others. We have ways to isolate more than ever before or be more joined than ever before. And it's the greatest double-edged sword in, you know, that I can think of because there's so many tremendous advantages to being so connected and having so much power at our fingertips. Mm -hmm. And there are also so many, uh, so many challenges. And I think we're seeing a lot of that playing out in, in, in the United States and in the world, I think that uh, a lot of what's happening is a result of how we're keeping pace with with the technology. Uh, what are some of the most dangerous uh, things that you see happening now? You know, I think we have an opportunity to be very connected to others in an anonymous way. So I think a lot of people are exploring some of the darker sides of the things that they think or feel and finding connection with other people who think or feel the same sort of things. And, and I think it can fuel, fuel the fire on some of that. I don't think that we're necessarily thinking more violent thoughts or, or, or having more, you know, I don't think that the, that, 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 the, that the type or frequency of those thoughts is changing, but I think our ability to connect to people anonymously and, and, and realize that it's widespread is really interesting. Are so I'm referring to January 6th, are you? I'm referring to radicalization on both sides. I'm referring oh, to- On both sides. How, how has the left, how have the liberals? I have to be myself. I have to express myself because I have a learned man in front of me and most of the times that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. I end up at a cafe reading to myself on an actual book. I wanna ask you about the difference between Kindle and actually holding a paper book. But uh, how has the left and the liberals and the hippies organized to create violence or disruption in America? 
I think, and I always tread carefully with this because I never wanted to get too political, but I think on both sides of the aisle, we why see- Why don't you want to get political? Why, why would that be wrong? Or, or because you work at Sierra Tucson? I, because I work in mental health, really. I, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not trying to pass judgment on one side necessarily or the other, because I think to your point, I, I think both, both uh, on the left and the right, we can, it's, it's easier than ever to get into these echo chambers where you only get certain news, news is presented in a certain way. And I think on both sides, we get the message that the other side is, is, is pure evil seems to be the message these days. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of challenges, I think, in the way that news is presented. So whether you lean to the left or the right or up, down, north or south, you can be plugged into a news source that, that reads as objective. I don't know that news ever really is, but, but is news that is being presented by people who, who share a similar viewpoint. And I think that, uh, you know, we, we've, we've become a lot more polarized in that particular way. Um, this is a bad thing. Do you think I, I, polarization is a bad thing? I do. I, I think that uh, I think the internet's afforded us an opportunity to, to to be polarized, to connect exclusively with people who share our own ideas, and I, I definitely think that that's a bad thing. You know, I think at the end of the day, there are certainly major differences between you know, different groups of people, but I think a lot of that, you know could be resolved differently or would be resolved differently in a more traditional face-to-face -face setting. So, okay. yeah, so that's, I think that's one way it's become dangerous. You certainly see increases in bullying. You see changes in people's behavior because they, you know, a lot of people might start in an anonymous forum uh, bullying and kind of get reinforced for that. And, and, you see some of that. And I also think that technology and media has a role. I'm not, not, not saying it's to blame, but I think it has a really important role in what we're seeing in terms of mass violence as well. I think a lot of that, as you look at some of these shooters, they, they can become radicalized, so to speak, in you know 4chan or 8chan or some of these different uh, different communities where, again, it's, it's an echo chamber. They're not getting enough input from the outside. They're not getting challenged enough. And, and some of these what, really what dangerous. Their, what, what parts of their parents play in that? Right. Isn't and the parents don't even. source of information from the parents and the schoolmates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the parent and the schoolmates can play into it. Or, I mean, as I was thinking about it, and talking about it, I was thinking they can even have a hidden life much more easily than, than ever before, where maybe parents and schoolmates have no idea, but they have this, this avatar or this, you know, this other, this virtual self that's maybe in a more radicalized place where they might be talking about, you know, they might be fantasizing about or glorifying violence towards others or really uh, spinning in some of those circles. I have a question. I don't even know if there's a right answer. At what age would you find it appropriate to give a child a smartphone? Oh, wow. That is, that is a great question. I, uh, um, I have a, I'm a parent of two young children, and I certainly don't know the answer yet. I think given I mean, it's interesting, right? Because I, I think I think we have a perception that society is very not safe right now. Um, so there's a part of me that says it would be great to give them an uh, you know an avenue to 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 connect to them to see where they're at. But I do think that a phone, <laughs> unlimited access to the internet, is is a danger too. So I imagine with my children, we might start to give them a phone that's very locked down in terms of its functionality at the point when they're in elementary school or middle school and they're starting to do a lot of things, you know, after school activities or, or uh, you know, playing with friends. So we might, you know, that's, that's kind of my guess right now, but in terms of when we might unlock some of that functionality on a phone, that'll be, that'll be an interesting topic. And I don't think I have the right answer for that quite yet, but it'd be a great- I understand that a phone that functions as a phone can be very useful since there are no more phone booths and no one can remember seven numbers anyway, or 10 numbers. 
uh, but I would just think I haven't seen a movement like you were talking about, like unlocking the internet on a phone, but they can still use it to communicate. Hey, yeah. you know, pick me up, this and that. Uh, but right now it seems like all phones are almost created equal, except the old fashioned flip phones. Uh, but okay, so no age yet. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's, it's a very interesting topic too. And I think it gets into a lot of, you know, it gets into parenting as well. How closely do you monitor what your kids are doing? You know, it, when, when do you get them a desktop to do their homework? Right. I mean, I think alone that in the other room, with all they, those. they, they need it or schools say that they need it probably younger and younger these days. So I, you know, I think that it forces parents to take a very different approach to really talk a lot to their children about honestly about the dangers of the internet at a at a younger age than maybe we would have had some of these serious scare conversations in the past you know it's forcing us to grow forcing kids to grow up quicker so what, what i'm sorry say that again i i think that i think that the changes in in technology and media are forcing forcing kids to grow up quicker do they have that emotional and brain circuitry ability to actually like a shift in human development is taking place? Do they have to grow up faster or else they'll be... I, 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 you know, that's, a, that's, that's an interesting question. Well, I was thinking we're just forcing them to grow up faster in the sense of we have to have conversations about the dangers of the world earlier than ever. And we have to talk more about some of the things that you know, some of the scary stuff that's out there earlier than ever. But I do think to your point, it's probably true that we're, we're adapting and evolving as a species and children are, are on a different trajectory than they've ever been before. That's a good, it's an interesting question. Remember the book that's now 50 years old called Future Shock? No, I don't, I'm not familiar. Um, 50 years ago, he said, there's going to be an abrupt collision of technology, the effect that it's going to have on people, that people aren't psychologically or emotionally or mentally ready for the incredible uh, swiftness of change. And of course, uh, you know, sometimes I say, I remember in my lifetime, I would take a photograph, take it to the drugstore, wait a week for the film to be, pro for the photos to be processed, and then send it to my friend in England. And that would take 14 days between getting the pictures developed and sticking it in an envelope and sending it to England. It would take about 14 days. And now I can take a picture and in 14 seconds, the same friend in Brighton, England can see the picture. Mm -hmm. What does that do? There's no more patience. You don't have to be patient anymore. Mm -hmm. And isn't patience something that's like a, like a survival thing of patience? Needing, no, I don't think anybody's alone anymore because you can never have to be alone because you can always call someone or FaceTime with someone. You know, I don't see young people sitting on a park bench pondering or wondering or just... Mm -hmm letting their minds take them where it will, because the mind usually takes me you know, to sometimes a darker place, but this can prevent it. I've said lately, or for the last couple of weeks, this is the new smoking. This is the new cigarette. When you're feeling anxious or bored, go outside for a cigarette. Same thing with this. When you pass by an office building in New York where all the workers used to be outside in the alleyway smoking, no one's smoking, but everybody is, is texting and looking on their phone. So maybe this is a lifesaver after all, because it gets, keeps people from smoking. I don't know. <laughs> so the DSM six, right? It's is that five the one? right now. I'm just, five. Well, yes. I was just <clears throat> I was extrapolating out. Okay. Is social media addiction uh, an illness yet, or a a, a, a disorder? It's, it's not recognized, actually, I, I have not really reviewed the, the 5TR, which is the newest revision, came out early 2022, but I don't believe 
So yeah, in, in the five, it was, I believe it was listed in the back under okay. is it areas for future study or something to that effect. Uh -huh. Uh, as internet, I think that the only thing that was in there was internet gaming disorder, which is, as we talked, that's that's one very narrow sliver of, of yeah. a much larger piece of, piece of pie. So um, it's not currently in there, which uh, well makes makes treatment difficult for people who need to utilize insurance for mental health treatment, and I think that that's particularly. Um, yeah, it's particularly salient because I, I think that it's exploding. The number of people for whom their smartphone and or their their computer use or any any of a number of different things is problematic or is at least a major piece of their problems is really significant. And to your anecdote just a minute ago, I mean, avoidance is one huge issue here. Like we can use these phones to really engage in a in a in a rich and engaging uh sort of world that's that's very separate and distinct from from the from the real world and there's there's good things about it but there's also a lot of challenges that come with it give me one of the good things well i think i mean to your point i don't think distraction is 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 terrible i don't think it's bad to be able to distract maybe it's lowering rates of smoking um you know it, it's it can be helpful to unwind at the end of a long day by playing a video game watching something on netflix scrolling through facebook within within reason but i i mean i certainly don't use it within reason all the time and i don't think many people do honestly I wonder, it's one of those yeah, if you, i wonder if you could ever gauge your like how often anymore and it doesn't happen very often do you leave your house or your office and leave your cell phone and realize 10 minutes later that you don't have it. You know, how much mm. anxiety do you get at that point? Oh, it's 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 paralyzing, at least for me. I it's I I could say I've never I've never gone 10 minutes without uh, without noticing my phone is missing really. So I remember 15 years ago, everyone was always leaving their phones in restaurants <laughs> and dropping them in the toilet. That doesn't happen anymore because it's now an appendage that you can't be without. You can't. Physically, mm -hmm. it has become attached to this invisible umbilical cord that, that, you, that you don't ever want to cut. Yeah. And it's, you know, I think that it's one part um, addiction in the sense that, uh, I mean, I think that a lot of it, or at least the type of use we're talking about right now, I think that that's about emotion regulation. And much like, you know, where, like, alcohol for somebody who's not an alcoholic, like a small amount of that, a small amount of electronics for emotion regulation is fine. But if you have all your eggs in one basket or that's your only way of regulating your emotions and you start to overuse it, um, it that's, that's really quite problematic. I also talk about technology. I, I, I vacillate between using addiction as the terminology or compulsion, because I think much like a compulsion, technology is something that on an emotional or experiential level feels like the solution to a problem, but is ultimately fairly ineffective at dealing with that problem and oftentimes even makes the problem worse. So if I am utilizing my phone to distract from my anxiety, it might, it might be fine in, the sh in my work in the short term, but long term, it's really just creating more anxiety because I'm avoiding wow. what I'm doing. So the underlying causes aren't being addressed. Right. And that's, yeah. and, and that's what I think about when I think about compulsions, or that's how I tend to define compulsions. You know, when you think about like the stereotype of, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to turn the lights on and off, you know, 12 times when I leave the room, it, you know, it probably does not solve the problem. And, you know, it might no one, no one does that way. anymore. No one does that anymore because they're too anxious to get to the internet. Yeah. So you don't have time to turn off the light. Exactly. No, uh, it's really an interesting world. It's, I mean, it's, it's always been interesting, but I think it's more interesting now. Um, uh, what, what does it look, what does it look like? 
What do fifteen what do fifteen and eighteen year olds look like to you in ten or twenty years? Where they're actually getting you know, they're they're actually getting uh, reception maybe in the womb. They know what's going on. They know that the mother, when they're walking them on the street, is on her phone the whole time and has no connection with their child because they're mm -hmm. too busy shopping or other things. How are, how is this gender? How are these five year olds today who don't get you know that kind of attention where? You know, the looking in the mother's eyes when you're born, I hear, is a very important bonding experience. Mm -hmm. That would be a great uh, <clears throat> film for our film festival. Yeah. Well, I... the birth of the child, they bring the kid in to breastfeed, and she's already on her phone. Right. I had a baby. I had a baby. Here it is. <laughs> say something. Say something. The mother delivers and the nurse says, do you want to see your baby while holding up an iPad? Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, let's, uh, but how yes. do you see the future? What do you, what, how, what, 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 so tell me something positive because I can't think of much. You know, I think there's, there's, there's the dystopian kind of version and there's the, there's the hopefully optimistic version. I mean, optimistically, I hope that in, 15 years, kids don't look too much different that we've maybe learned as, as, a, as a society or as smaller communities or as families to incorporate enough social connection to keep them relatively engaged. When you say they look the same, you mean their necks aren't crooked? From uh, no, I'm serious. Or their thumbs aren't smaller or bigger to be able uh -huh. to you know, function? Um, that's that's certainly a possibility. I, I'm worried or I'm concerned um, less about posture, but more about isolation. I'm worried that we would go in a direction where both, you know, like real time social interaction becomes drastically reduced and drastically limited. Uh, and even virtual interaction, you know, it's it's so different when you have a few seconds or a few minutes to really think about your response. And you think, you know, people, it's like Instagram syndrome, right? When you've got a little bit of time to think about how you want to present yourself to the world, you can be all, you know, you can always be witty. You can always seem interesting. You can always be a fascinating person, but that puts such tremendous pressure on people when they do have to have a, an actual real life conversation. So I guess that's my concern is that we get more and more disconnected just from interacting real time face to face with people and lose some of those skills and start to experience all of the stressors and pressures that come from trying to portray the same level of, of control in our everyday life that we do in our virtual self. You know, and I, I think that that's as part of why a lot of people are struggling these days is, hey, you look at who your role models are and how do they portray themselves? Because they seem so perfect, you know? That well, the, the Kardashians, Kardashians, I think the Kardashians are the new gods of, of our culture. Right. And none, and none of them look real. None of them look real and somehow that's still aspirational and... Uh, and all, you know, they, they show us the life that they want to show us. You don't see the moments when they, when they stumble or they get emotional or they don't know what to say unless it's a carefully cultivated scene, you know? And that, that's a really interesting example for, for what a life should, be, should look when, like. When was the last time you saw like four 18 year olds having lunch where no one's cell phone ever came out? for mm -hmm. any reason whatsoever, where the conversation was completely organic between individuals where they weren't showing the latest picture or something, or here's what I just bought, or or get or get you know, getting a text during lunch and preferring to, you know, talk or communicate with the person who's not at the table. Yeah. Have you seen four eighteen year olds at lunch without a phone in how many years? Oh, probably not. 
think it's it's so addictive. It's almost uncomfortable to think, oh, it's been it's been 20 minutes since I've checked my phone. Oh my goodness. You know? Not 20 minutes. It's yeah, like, five, maybe. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Something you we can, can agree on. Yeah. You can see people twitch. Uh, you know, periodically I'll 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 run a meeting here and I may like periodically I'll say to people let's all put our phones down here in the center of the room so we can't use them. And I mean, you see people literally twitching and looking at their phones and heck I'm doing it too. Let's be honest. Mm -hmm. it's, so it's, 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 a, it's a actual physiological withdrawal. I, I think that there's a good argument to make to be made that we're having withdrawal symptoms from our phones on a, on a physical level. It seems like obsessive gaming to get back to that would cause some sort of brain circuitry changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, games are so well engineered right now to, to kind of hit that like maximal payoff circuitry in the brain. So they get right at like, you know, they've done so much study and so much trial and error about how to get that motivation and reward portion of the brain maximally stim stimulated that I think people who, who do game, they, you know, it, it, it impacts their non-gaming life because they get used to just the really quick payoff. They get used to, you know, what, like this like five to 10 minute cycle of, I put in a moderate amount of, of, of effort with a, with a tiny amount of risk and I get a moderate amount of reward and then I do it again and then I do it again. And I think they can be then challenged to, to engage or, or feel satisfied by, you know, tasks that don't fit into that kind of a pattern. There might even be another aspect of, we do a, Real Recovery Film Festival every year. And a few years ago, we showed an episode of uh, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. And it was about the character, Charlie was addicted to a certain game. It was a game and he was moving up on levels. And, and at one point he, she says, why do you have to do this all the time? And he said, because when I'm doing good at the game, I'm doing good in life, mm -hmm. but not real life just the life in that dimension. And he can, you know, I had a, have a son who grew up playing violent video games and, 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 and those violent images have not left him because he's an artist and he expresses himself through his art, through violent images. And when he was growing up, he was the, the king of the game mm -hmm. when he would go outside and one half-assed bully would, would say something to him, he was nobody. He was not, he, he did, his strength came from a world that didn't exist outside the metaverse. Right. And it, it didn't bode well. Uh, but yeah, that's, do that as it may. Um, that's one thing I've noticed with gaming is, you know, for the most part in the, and there, there's single player games and multiplayer games, which I think attract very different sorts of people. But in, in these multiplayer games, there's a really, it's a really clear hierarchy, if you will. You can be, you know, a leader of a clan or a guild and, and you know kind of who reports to who. And, and you, you organize your interactions with people around the quest to save the world or you know the quest to kill the evil warlock or whatever and i see so many of those people struggling in real life to relate to people when they don't have that kind of built-in almost questing system like they don't know how to how to appeal to people or just say let's let's hang out let's let's enjoy each other's company without having that direction of you know let's enjoy each other's company while while slaying a dragon um, so I, I've seen I've seen people struggle in in that regard and having a social interaction in a place where where those relationships aren't nearly as well defined and where the where the the common goals of, of people who are connected are not as clearly defined. Uh, I see we're running out of time because uh, Paul Maccabee, whose name I completely love, told me it was going to be like a thirty minute privilege to talk with you. I hope I haven't spoken over you too much and 
your information is very salient and, and, and apropos, and it's going to be an interesting future. Uh, it's going Absolutely. to be really interesting. Uh, there's good people on both sides. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. I, I think I, we I still... Being, I'm sorry, I was being facetious. Oh, good. Are we, are we back to politics here? <laughs> okay. I think, I think there's, there's people on both sides. And, and I think, uh, and I think to, to the broader thing, to the broader questions about uh, technology, I, I think that it's a double-edged sword. It has a lot of a lot of advantages, and I hope we, I hope as a society, we continue to grow closer together yeah. instead of further apart, and continue to find ways to utilize all this stuff for good, and not totally just succumb to using it for avoidance and and for for negative sorts of connections. I was going to ask you one other question. Mm -hmm. How many times does a person have to purchase something on Amazon a day? For, for you to diagnose them as a serious in problem or a disorder, a shopping disorder. How many deliveries from Amazon? And it, if it got really high during the pandemic and you still keep ordering things, is that a problem? I, it, it certainly sounds like it could be. We go back to kind of that the, the, the loose definition in the DSM of is it causing clinically significant distress or impairment basically is it bothering you or is it creating big problems in the world and that's that's certainly a starting point and then we can also look at those standard factors of addiction you know have you have you tried to cut down unsuccessfully and and, and not been able to uh, are you getting withdrawals are you spending a lot of time thinking about it is it disrupting your relationships um, are you getting a tolerance you know, is your is your spending to your example increasing and increasing and increasing? So there's there's a lot of ways I think to approach that problem because you know if you're if you're filthy rich and you're ordering stuff off of Amazon all the time, maybe it's not a problem. But if you can't afford it, then then we're probably having a different conversation. And if the Kardashians are promoting it, I think it behooves you to buy it. Oh yeah, then we've all got to do it for sure. Okay. All right. Well, awesome. say hi to Paul. This was terrific, and we'll figure out what we're going to do next. Okay. All right. Great. Days, I'd like to get out to your campus and visit. Oh, perfect. That would be great. We'd love to have you. Okay. Well, anyway, have a great afternoon. Thank you so much, Leonard. I appreciate the opportunity. Likewise. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs>